I'm going to show you how I use this reference to create this painting in every little step in between from start to finish. So step one is to head over to Pinterest or some other place where you can find cool pictures to be inspired by. Uh, just find an interesting reference. Don't bother trying to find the perfect reference. Otherwise, you'll be searching forever. I think a good benchmark for what makes an interesting reference is how quickly it catches your eye. I found this one some time ago and I chose it because it immediately stood out to me. But I can't for the life of me find the original source, so whoever at Alvg, Alvg is whoever you are, if you're watching this, please reach out to me so I can credit you. Step two is to identify what you like about your chosen reference. What stood out to me in this picture was the lighting coming from behind the subject and the way it passes through the cloth. Anything in a picture that makes you go, wow, that's pretty neat, I'd like to make a painting that captures that, is probably going to make a good reference. This step is important because it prevents you from going into a painting directionless and gives you sort of an objective. My objective with this painting is to capture the lighting of the environment. That's it. Step three is to find an art influence or someone to draw inspiration from. I grabbed a bunch of paintings from Yu Ming Li, an artist whose style I really like, and put them on a reference board for me to look at while I paint. I go through the hard work of figuring out how you want to simplify or stylize things when someone else has already done it for you. And in case you're interested, this reference board that I always use is called Pureff, and I'll put a link for it in the description. Okay, step four is make a sketch, or some sort of blocking or outline of some sort. It usually helps to rough out the most important shapes of your subject before you begin painting. I try not to spend too long on this part, and in this painting, this sketch only took seven minutes. I usually just want to hurry up and move on to the painting part, so just get the essentials down and move to step five, which is to create a base for the painting. Make a layer under your sketch and fill it with a color that you want to be the primary undertone of the painting. Here I deviated from the reference a bit and chose sort of a bluish tone. There are two things I always do at this part. First, I make sure this color is around 50% saturation and 50% brightness, so somewhere in the middle of the color wheel. I do this because it creates a pretty neutral base for the painting, and it makes it easier to add brighter or darker values later in the process. It basically helps you keep your values in check. And the second thing is that I don't just use one color. I try to vary it a bit to make a more interesting and colorful base. I want my final painting to have all of these colors in it to some degree, so I'm putting them here now. I also create a base for the subject I'm painting, following the same principles as the background. Step six is to merge everything to one layer. Now I know some people are scared of only working on one layer, but trust me when I say that it makes the painting process so much easier because you can blend and manipulate everything at the same time. One thing you can do to make it less scary is saving a copy of the layers before you merge them, but more than likely you're not even going to use them anyway, and they can just be there for peace of mind. When my painting's on one layer, I do this thing throughout the process where I create a duplicate of the entire painting and continue working on the top layer. I do this for a few reasons. The first reason is just so that when I'm making adjustments to the canvas, there's always something underneath the painting since it's only one layer. And another reason is that this duplicate acts sort of like a save state or a checkpoint that I can toggle between or even go back to if I don't like the direction the painting's going in. I usually make these duplicate layers when I like how the painting is going so far and I want to try to maintain as much of this energy as I can in the final painting. Sometimes I tend to overwork an area and lose that initial feeling that it had, so it's always helpful for me to be able to go back if I need to. I even have a dedicated hotkey to duplicate the layer I'm working on, but if you don't, Ctrl plus A, Ctrl plus C, Ctrl plus V should do the trick. Now that my painting looks like this, it's time for step 7, which is to render. Okay, so this is probably the hardest step to explain, because how this process goes really comes down to the individual, so I'll try to divide what rendering means to me into a few components. From this point, I start adding more hue variation and texture in a form of essentially random brush strokes in the foreground and background. See how I used oranges and pinks here? There's really no reason for me to choose these colors other than the fact that I think they create a more interesting painting overall. I also experiment with different brushes to see what cool textures I can come up with on the dress and the background. And besides working on color and texture, this is also the step where I adjust the shapes and edges of every object in the image. 
I start to spend more time on the shape of the windows in the background and cleaning up and sharpening edges of the dress and her hair and sort of sculpting these different areas of the painting. This is pretty much the part of the process where I bring the painting to a level of doneness that I feel comfortable with. In this case, I didn't even feel like completing her face or the hands, but I'm cool with that because I like how the image looked as a whole. So once I'm satisfied, I move on to step eight, where I create final adjustments to the image. The biggest adjustment I make here is to the contrast and brightness of the painting. I do this firstly by playing with the contrast and brightness sliders until I'm satisfied with the depth of the colors and the overall contrast of the painting. And I'll also make a new layer and set it to glow dodge and use an airbrush to go over the light sources of a scene. So in this case, I used a blue color over the windows on a glow dodge layer, which created a much stronger glowing effect. This step is also where I crop the image to dimensions that I feel frame the painting better. Cropping is important because you don't want a bunch of unnecessary space in the image. So now that I think this painting is about finished, I export it as a PNG in preparation for step 9, which is the secret technique I use to add a raised texture to my finished painting, and that is to use an emboss tool. So I use Clip Studio Paint, and as far as I know, there is no emboss effect or tool built into it. So I have to find one online for this step. But if you use Photoshop, then you can just do this within a program. This is the one I always use, and I'll put a link to it in the description. Please Clip Studio Add Emboss. All you need to do is upload the image we just saved and click Apply. I usually leave these settings alone first. And once it's done, I copy and paste the image back into our drawing software. And once it's on its own layer above the painting, then I set this layer to a blending mode called Soft Light. This is what creates the effect between this new layer that we created and the original painting beneath. I feel like using this embossing technique really emphasizes each brush stroke and texture in a way that makes the painting feel more lifelike. And you can always go back and play around with the parameters to get the effect you want. And that's pretty much it. If you have any questions about anything I did, please ask me in the comments and I'll reply. Join my Discord and uh, subscribe and I'll make more videos. Uh, okay, bye. Please, please join my Discord, please.